So I'm going to talk a little bit about inks and pens and how to go about making them. Now, when I say inks, what I really mean is inks or pens, because functionally they're essentially the same thing. They do the same job, they have the same components, there are slight differences in them, and when we cover those differences, I'll point them out. Now, all inks contain the three, same three basic components, and that is some kind of functional material, some kind of carrier, and some kind of binder. Now, what I mean by functional material is, in a standard ink, what you're interested in, really, is the colour. But in a conductive ink, what you're interested in is the conductivity. So the material that either gives it an ink its colour or its conductivity is the functional material, that material that imparts the conductivity, or the piece of electricity, or the um, colour to the ink. So the functional material is the material that you want to use to give your ink its particular qualities. And the second thing is the carrier. The carrier is that material which makes it fluid, it's what makes it printable, it's what makes it pentable. And the third thing is the binder. The binder is the material that holds everything together. If you didn't have a binder, then it would just drop off the surface that you put it on, and it would just flake and crack. So these three are the essential ingredients. Now, the, they change depending on the surface that you want to put them on, because the surfaces are different. Paper is a very open, porous surface, so you want something that will sink into the paper and mechanically grip it, almost like a hand gripping the paper. And it needs to wet the paper. So if you think about what wetting is, if you take a drop of water and put it onto a sheet of plastic, what will happen is the water will form a drop, it won't spread out, it will sit on top of the plastic. It won't wet the plastic, it won't spread out on the plastic. If you put the same drop of water onto the paper, then it will spread out onto the paper and it will wet the paper. So the carrier has to be wettable for the surface, and you have to match those two up. This is why water-based pens won't work on plastic. They don't wet properly, so they don't sit on it properly. They also don't um, grip it properly, but that's more a property of the binder than it is of the carrier. So the carrier is going to change depending on the surface that you want to put it on. Now, what we all want, really, is an innocuous character, carrier. A carrier that has low uh, volatile organic contents, is not particularly poisonous, is not particularly harmful to the environment. That's the ideal. So, a lot of the times, what people are looking for is to use water as the carrier. And this is obvious reason why water is a good carrier. But it's not always the right carrier for uh, certain kinds of inks. So you get an awful lot of alcohol-based inks, for instance, and you get different organic um, contents um, there's carriers, so you'll get toluene, xylene, uh, dichloromethane, all kinds of things can be used as carriers, depending on the situation in which you're going to use them, and depending on what kind of application you have in mind. Now, obviously, we're looking at um, conductive inks here, and that's what we're looking at in the long run, and that's what we're looking at making. Now, we're looking at making conductive inks that are safe to use. Now, safe is a broad scope thing. I mean, when you think about the kind of machinery that you use in an industrial setting, it's perfectly safe as long as you use it in a responsible manner. So if you go trying to scratch your arm with a chainsaw, then you probably shouldn't have a chainsaw, but you're certainly not using it in a safe manner. If you use a chainsaw in a safe manner, it's totally safe to use it. You have to use it responsibly though, so there's a degree of responsibility on the user's part. Now the general public normally get carriers of water, because <laughs> <coughs> the general public can be um, a little lax with their own personal safety and uh, a little lax with their own sense of personal responsibility. So if they hurt themselves doing something stupid, you will get people who will blame the other person and um, with our current culture of suing people, it can be a problem. So the general public tend to get the safe carriers. Unfortunately, of course, it means that it actually won't do the job. Industry tends to get um, more esoteric car uh, carriers that do a very, very good job because they're used in a responsible manner. There's all sorts of safety guidelines and um, safe practices in place, and if the worker steps outside of those safety guidelines, normally just get sacked because they're, they're dumb enough to do it, they probably deserve it. So they get better carriers, more, more suitable to the job that they need to do. Now, the binder, obviously, has to glue 
the functional material onto the surface. Now, um, different binders will, will react differently with different surfaces. So you can use a binder uh, like gum arabic, for instance, on paper surfaces, uh, wood surfaces, uh, leather, that kind of thing, because the gum arabic will interspert into the fabric of the, those kind of surfaces. And as I said before, grip it like fingers. It won't work on a plastic surface. On a plastic surface, you need a different kind of binder that will effectively melt a little bit of the plastic and grip it that way. Now, the carrier has to act as an intermediary between the functional material and the binder and the surface that it's going to attach to. So the carrier not only has to wet the surface, it also has to wet the function. So um, good materials that make binders are some of these kind of things. This is uh, boron linseed oil. This is a good oil-based binder. It's used in artist oil paints, incidentally, and was used in standard oil paints until recently. Uh, and that makes a very good binder and um, will set quite hard, actually. Another good binder is um, this stuff, which is RTV silicon. It will give you a very flexible material. So your you, um, paint or ink will actually be very flexible if you use this stuff. Another good binder is um, this stuff, which is gum arabic. This is um, food grade, so you could actually take a teaspoon to this and eat it if you wanted. It's not very nice to eat like that. Um, Mostly it's used to make jellies and to set things, but it's used in watercolour paints. Normal artists' watercolour paints use this stuff. Food grade's a very high grade, so um, quite a useful binder to have. Uh, another very useful binder is um, this stuff, polyvinyl acetate. This is actually builder's polyvinyl acetate, so it's a mixture of polyvinyl acetate and polyvinyl alcohol, but again, a very good binder. Now, the uh, most used binder... <laughs> is uh, this stuff. This stuff is an um, alkyd. It's what's used in uh, modern varnishes and modern paints. It's actually a suspension, an emulsion in fact. There's still some left in there. Yeah, there we go. It's quite a thin emulsion, whitish in colour, and they're alkyds. And they're the uh, most used binders in modern paints because they have a low VOC and a good adherence to most substrates. Now, what you're looking for when you're looking at a binder is, in essence, will it stick to the surface? Is it going to wet and hold the functional material to whatever surface you want to apply it to? If it won't do that, it's a poor binder. If it will do that, it doesn't actually matter what it is, it will be a good binder. The ones I've shown you are, are really the ones that are most used. The um, functional materials is um, absolutely huge as a subject. Now, in uh, normal inks, they actually just divide into two types. They're either a uh, pigment or a dye. The difference is that a pigment is actually um, small particles, normally small particles of colour. They're ground very fine and they're dispersed in the carrier and the binder. The dye is uh, usually a uh, chemical, and you can get dyes from all kinds of things. I actually wrote a book called Wild Colour, which is all about getting dyes from uh, natural sources around you. One of the oldest inks in the world is uh, a dye-based ink from um, oak galls, uh, oak apples, the, the little round hard things that you get in oak trees as a result of gall wasps sort of trying to lay the eggs in the tree. They swell up like little hard apples, you pick them when they're hard, grind them up, mix them with ferric sulphate, and you get a nice brown ink. And that's a dye-based ink, a natural dye-based ink. So there's an awful lot of natural um, colours available out there that you can basically just step out of your door and pick. Um, blackberries actually are very good because the dye in blackberries actually gives you quite a, a nice, rich, deep colour. And there is a berry called the ink berry, and it's called the ink berry for obvious reasons. It gives you a nice, deep, rich colour that will last. So, the dyes and pigments used as functional materials in standard inks are readily available anywhere, and you really should uh, experiment if coloured inks are what you're interested in. Now, obviously, what we're interested in are um, the more esoteric functional materials because we're really looking at things like conductive inks, uh, inks for batteries, inks for solar cells, that sort of stuff. 
So the functional materials that we're interested in aren't as restricted as pigments and dyes, they're much, much broader. But a lot of the videos that have been doing and will be doing are all about those functional materials. So for example, I've already done a video on how to make nickel oxyhydroxide. That's a functional material. If you take that nickel oxyhydroxide and you mix it with a carrier and binder, you will actually get a, an ink suitable for printing batteries. So quite a lot of that stuff has already been done. What it really is about is putting it all together uh, and um, building the kind of application that you want to build from it. So when you're looking at building those applications, like I said, there are these three basic things to consider. Now, other things are added to inks, depending again on the function that you want that ink to do. I mean, take a normal paint, for instance. If you use a normal dye paint and you want to uh, apply it to a wall, it will actually be quite bad because it'll be quite thin, give you no protection. So very often what's added it is a filler. A filler is usually just an inert substance and it will take the dye coating onto it and help give the paint or ink body. There's a bit of strength to it really. Very often titanium dioxide is used. It's quite inert, zinc oxide also, quite inert. Gives it body, gives it some strength, and you get filler addition to it. Now, when you're using something like a um, battery ink, so the nickel oxyhydroxide, what would be a good filler is a conductive filler. So you might put in here, for instance, some graphite. Some carbon nanotubules, some graphite. Those conductive fillers in uh, battery inks obviously help the battery ink to perform an awful lot better because uh, the problems with nickel oxyhydroxide is it isn't actually very conductive by itself. So if you put a conductive filler in between your functional material, then when it reacts uh, in its um, battery form, then the conductive filler will help it perform the function much, much better. So fillers can either be inert or they can help the function be uh, performed better. There might be other things in it, for instance there might be a mismatch between the carrier and the functional material wettability. So you might put something in there, um, like a surfactant, to help the wettability, to help the uh, carrier spread around the functional material and maybe wet the surface that it's actually going to go on. So you can also have um, surfactants added. Now, normally in production inks, you um, have to expect them to have a longer lifespan than a few days. If you're making inks for yourself, and you're making something like a temperate ink, for instance, a temperate ink would use um, water as the carrier. Uh, the binder is actually just egg yolk. So you use egg yolk as the binder, and the functional material, probably a pigment, say raw sienna, something like that. So you mix those three together, and you'll make a very good um, kind of orange paint. But it won't last, you have to put it in your fridge, and you have to use it in about a week, because you've made it yourself, and there's um, no preservatives in there. So you have to put something in there um, to keep the thing from going off, especially some of the organic paints, if you're using organic dyes, organic colours, um, organic binders like gum arabic or um, egg yolk, something like that, then they're going to rot. So you need to put something in there to prevent that and give it a longer shelf life. So obviously what you put in, you put in a preservative. Now there are quite a lot of preservatives available to you. There are the artificial preservatives, uh, like Uox and Mighty for instance. But you can also put in uh, natural preservatives. So um, oil of cloves is a good preservative, as is a tablespoon of salt. This is, this is one of the reasons they salt food. It, it preserves it as its finger. These things will act as preservatives. So you very often get a preservative in there as well. But these are additional materials. These are materials that are core to the production of an ink or paint. The core materials are these three. And as long as you bear in mind what those three are and what those three are going to do, you're going to make a, a big step towards understanding the making of inks and paints. Okay, so this is just a basic introduction really, give you a framework in which we're going to work uh, from in the future. So I hope it helped and um, I hope you're going to enjoy the rest of it. Thank you very much for watching.